Today we're going to talk about what Christ does for us. Intercession of Christ. You know, you've been taught to pray intercessory prayers, that's to say for someone else, but today I want you to think about what Christ does for us. As, as the Hebrew is written, and let's take uh, Isaiah 53, which we're going to go there in a moment. The word intercession there, or to intercede, is paga in the Hebrew, and it means to come between. In other words, he's going to stand there between you and your trouble, and he's going to take care of business. Okay. That's how he intercedes. That's what he is all about is taking care of his own. When you deserve it, and when you ask for it, and when you're on his mission, you know, and his mission might, is just everyday life, setting the example of what a person of Christ looks like, acts like, and is. Okay? He's gonna take care of you. Now, many of you get in pinches and you, I mean, it just looks like there's no way out. The world's coming to an end. You are worried, 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 and you pray a little bit, and bang, it just disappears. And you wonder, well, what was I so worried about in the first place? Just an accident. Uh-uh. No accident. Father takes care of his own. Now, we have President's Day, and we've, we've had some good presidents, and we've had some mm-mm-mm. But, um, you know, along the way, at least they all filled the bill, okay? But men are men, and, and in that, we do the best we can. But when we choose to follow God, when we choose to follow his son, when we choose to allow him to be our intercessor, we're using the old hip, okay? You're, you're keeping it sharp. You're right on it. And... That's what, today we're kind of going to play. We're just going to just coast through some of the things and scriptures that we come from that are so very basic. But sometimes in tough times, when things look like they're not going right, you want to get back to the basics. You want to know who's standing um, uh, between you, Paca between you and trouble. Man, it is the Lord Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God. I mean, what more could you ask for? And I know that in life we have doubters too. They'll say, well, I wonder why you won't do that for me. Well, think about it, okay? If, if you're doing his business, he's going to assist you, you know. Uh, you might say, well, how, how can you document, hey, you're looking at it at Shepherd's Chapel. You know, I mean, a little a roller rink church that goes around the world. You know, that thousands on top of thousands of thousands of people study with. You know, that, that's not an accident. That's the will of God. The fact that truth prevails. And when he chooses you, he knows he can count on you, and that's why he chose you. That's why you have eyes to see and you have ears to hear. Now, we know that the spurious Messiah comes first. We're geared for it, okay? That's no problem because we know we have someone standing between us and him anyway, and that he has given, would you believe it, he has given you power over Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. And many might say, well, I, 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 trust me, you know, trust me. In many years, I have used that name to cast out demons. They run, okay. They're afraid of Almighty God and the power of Jesus Christ. That's to say evil spirits for those of you that understand. So he gives you that power and that authority. You don't have anything to worry about. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah 53. Let's go back in the Old Testament. And let's, um, you're all familiar with this and probably could quote this chapter from heart. In verse 1, it simply says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? 
Well, it's his elect that it's revealed to. The arm of the Lord is his power, his authority, what he intends to do. For, and he promised us this, a child. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, just like you did. Tender little old baby, one of the helpless, most helpless things in the world is a human baby, okay? Uh, and as a root out of a, a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. This is hedar in the Hebrew, and it means magnificent beauty and splendor is what it means, not what some people might call comely. Uh, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. In other words, he's, he's perfect. Why? As God said in the beginning, let us create man in our image. When you look at him, you look at God. That's why he liked and lacked nothing. Because if you've seen the Son, John chapter 14, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. So there he was. He grew up like you did, God wanting to experience Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us, showing you how to do it, okay? Showing you how to get it done. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. It seems like people just didn't care. You know, the majority of people today are brothers and sisters in this world that are not acquainted with our Father. That's kind of the way they feel. They smirk. They make light. And men, they don't know what they're messing with. They turn their back on him. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded. He was pierced for our transgressions. For he is no ours. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. In other words, he's your intercessor. He stood in for you, and he took that punishment to show you, again, how it's done, but at the same time, to heal you. Why? Through his paying that price when we believe, when you sin and repent, the most beautiful thing of Christianity, he forgives you. He takes you in his arms, he loves you, and he forgives you. And he takes that great big book of life that's in heaven. That's your real church letter, okay? Right there in heaven. And he takes that book of life and he erases that sin by your name. And it's just white as snow. It's clean. It's gone. And just like he says in certain scriptures, it's forgiven. I don't want to hear about it again. And will you sin again after that? Probably. You know, we're, we're human beings and there's none of us perfect. But that's how much he loves us. And that's why he stands between, which is to say intercedes for us to see that we have that clean slate in heaven to be judged by. It's, you know, uh, it's kind of your choice. Do you want to be judged by a long rap sheet that's not too pretty, or do you want a clean sheet with rewards? Okay, I'll take the rewards, okay? The six, all we, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He carried that. He did it for us. That is to say, for those that wished to participate, that wished to believe him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. You know, this is written about 700 years B.C., do you understand his crucifixion in the year about 33 A.D.? This came to pass, exactly as it's written. When he was delivered up in trial, Pontius Pilate, his wife, had already warned him, look, I had a vision last night. God told me this is an innocent man. And Pontius Pilate was trying to get him off. 
And he said, don't you understand how serious these are, charges are? What do you have to say? And Christ opened not his mouth. Why? Because of you. Because of sinners. He was going to pay this price that our mess-ups, our shortcomings, when we have those bad days, hung on that cross with him. He did it. He stood between and just wiped her clean when one repented. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Not his own. But the transgression of my people, God says. And so it was. Did he, you know, when he was delivered up there, did he say, mm, let me think about this. Maybe, maybe I'll put this off, okay? Maybe I'll wait till tomorrow, you know, and then I'll change. Then I'll do it for the people. No, he, he didn't open his mouth. He didn't whimper. He was no wimp. He did it for you. He, inter he stood between you and Satan, between you and sin, and loved you for it all at the same time when people were cursing him spitting at him beating him he did it for you verse 9 and he made his grave with the wicked two sinners hanging on each side of him malefactors and with the rich in his death he was buried in his uncle rich he had a rich uncle joseph of arimathea and he was buried in his tomb. First, it, 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 no one had ever been in that tomb before. Freshly made for him, for his un rich uncle. These are prophecies, my friend, proving to you that this report is true. So when you read that first verse, to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? It's you. To know it is true. That, um, and, and you know the beauty of it? That one of these mal malefactors stop the other for ranging Christ because he converted and Jesus said this day I will see you in paradise this day and immediately when they when the ghost when the spirit holy spirit departed he was with him in paradise okay verse 10 yet it pleased the lord to bruise him this is yahweh in the upper case, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. That's the offspring, me, in spirit. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It does today. We rejoice in him. We love him. We follow him. Many people might say, well, how, how can you prove Christ lived? Well, do you ever look at a calendar? Hmm? What does it say? Well, it says 2007 A.D. Well, do you know what A.D. means? It's Anno Domini, which is to say, what, the year of our Lord. What is it when we see B.C., before Christ? So... Yeah, you, you don't have to go too far to prove he walked this earth. He was real. He did this for you. Verse 11, listen carefully. He, he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's just, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify, that's to say make things right for many. For he shall bear their iniquities. That's what he is to you, beloved. He was willing to do that. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't complain. He stood between you and that that is evil. And when you see that evil approaching today, take comfort. That's why I'm giving this very simple, basic lecture. Be comforted. Rejoice. And no, why? Verse 12, 
Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, converting some, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession. There's the word, stood between, made intercession for the transgressors. He does that for you. Stands between, comes between. That word justify in the Hebrew means to make things right. When, when you mess up and repent and he forgives, he fixes it and makes it right, okay? You gain by it. You know, when Christ fixes something, you're always a far stronger person for it because, hey, let's simplify it. You know better than to go that way again, okay? It's that simple. And he, and, and he forgives you, loves you, and helps you on your way. He's the intercessor. You know, it is amazing that someone loved us enough that they paid that price. You see, there had to be a perfect sacrifice. It goes much deeper than that as far as the marriage is concerned. Okay, God divorced Israel. Someone had to die before Israel was free to remarry again. And there is a new wedding coming. Spiritual, I'm speaking spiritual now. Okay. How our Father loves his children. And you know something? He has a real special intercession for his election. Let's document it. You read it many, many times. Go to the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. How precious our Father is that when he destroyed the first earth age, he knew what he was doing. He brought this earth age in, and it's the age of salvation, to save his children. That's typical of a father to want to save his children. And that's why he sent that Savior. That's why he sent that intercessor. You can kind of see the old world in this first verse we're going to read today, verse 18. Creature is creation. It means the, the natural things of this earth, trees, mountains, flowers, rivers, streams. Verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, you think it's bad? You cannot imagine how beautiful it's going to be for God's elect. He's going to straighten this world out. All these gases and pollutions and what have you. He has energy uh, in a different, little different dimension that is, we can hardly imagine in the very presence of God, okay? 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature, call it creation and you'll, you'll understand better, wait us for the manifestation of the sons of God. When does that happen? God's children, when do they really shine? Millennium, okay. They, even the... Nature itself looks forward to that joyous time of salvation. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Um, emptiness was placed there and pollution and a few other things, not to mention 21, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's going to be good. You can't imagine. You might say, well, I just wonder if it's worth it. Hey, you just can't even imagine to have all the evil people gone. You, you know what? You don't have to worry about being accosted. You don't have to worry about somebody insulting you. They're all friends. They're all wonderful at that time. I'm talking about when God gets through. Okay. And you have a part in it. 
Christ sits at the right hand of God until all of his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think is going to put them there? Okay? So don't get lazy on the Father. He's got work for you. You have a destiny and a purpose. 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Like labor pains for the birth of the new age. That's what this means in the Greek. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. That means even God's election. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting patiently, of course, for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. What body is it talking about? Your spiritual body. Do you know what your body was before you were born in the flesh? Beautiful spiritual body. That is your body. You were there for eons of time. And you're going back, okay? You're going back into that body. It never gets sick. It doesn't age. It doesn't get old. It's always nice. <laughs> Sometimes. At the end of the millennium, it will always be nice after that. You know, it, it is a, it's a beautiful thing to absorb the true meaning in the Greek from the tree that gives fruit every month. That it stops any disagreement or boredom. And that's a beautiful thought, you know, a beautiful thought. And, of course, I'm pulling that from Revelation 22. 24, verse 24 here in this 8th chapter. For we are saved by hope. You want to listen real carefully to this. You hope, uh, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what do, why doth he get hope for? You know, God gives us credit for those that believe and haven't seen. And many people pray they want to see. You want to be real careful what you pray for. Because once you've seen, you better keep those tugs tight. Okay, That means do it. I'm talking years ago when we had worked horses, okay? A tug is a chain that hooks to the collar or a leather strap. It's a tug that pulls the plow, okay? You better keep them tight. That means working, okay? Because hope is not there for you because he's showing you and you know for a fact. So that makes it a lot different, okay? Verse 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. You know it's going to be there. Do you know how much God loves somebody that believes in something they haven't seen actually? A lot, okay? Likewise, the Spirit helpeth, also helpeth our infirmities. That's our weaknesses. You got weaknesses? God's Spirit will help them. You get a little dread every once in a while, a little wheezy in the tummy, kind of, not, I'm not going to call you a wimp because I can't stand wimps, okay? But maybe you back up a little bit. Well, he strengthens you. You can believe that. It's the truth. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You don't know 100% what you're supposed to be doing right now. You really don't. You have a pretty good idea. So do you know what he does? But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He sighs and shows you the way and turn. Have you ever, have you ever been somewhere and something worked out and you wonder, my goodness, that was simple. How did that happen? Well, you just had help, okay? He touched you. So thank him when that happens. Don't forget it, all right? He knows, especially, understand we're talking about his set-aside ones, his election here, first fruits. 27, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession, there it is again, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Not men, not presidents, not governments, but by the will of God. For the will of God. Why? You've got a destiny and a purpose. And he's going to help you through that. When you don't know exactly the Holy Spirit, I mean, after all, is it not written in Mark 13 that when you're delivered up, the Holy Spirit will do all the talking? Not part of it, all of it. 
He said, don't you even premeditate what you're going to say. I'll do the talking when you're delivered up, through you, of course. So let it be no marvel that the Spirit, when you're in your daily life, setting an example for the Father, that he's not going to nudge things a little bit to keep things in order. Why? That's the way he wants it. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not theirs, not somebody else's, not some church's purpose, but God's purpose. And it's written, here's the plan of the day. You know, any military person, one of the first things they want to read is the plan of the day to know what's happening. So they get it right, okay? And the troops get it right. So God did that for you. He gave you a plan of the day according to his purpose, his will. 29, for whom he did foreknow. That means knew from before. That is to say the first earth age before you were even born in the flesh. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, when he chose, why? why? Because don't make a big complicated thing out of it. God's election fought Satan in the first earth age. They weren't sucked in, okay? They earned it. So it's no free ride and it's nobody the prettiest. It's just that they can cut it. Rather than finding Satan tempting, they find him to be an abomination. And they will fight. They will stand against him. Predestined. Chosen from before. You know, a lot of people like to read over that because then we have free will and they can't fit the two together. Some people have free will and some people have a destiny. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Those that have the destiny owe something to those with free will. That's to say to set an example. That's why you're here is to help them, to pray for them, to show in your example of life what a Christ person looks like, acts like, and the work that you do. That doesn't mean you, you um, in your work that you do, you don't start passing out leaflets down on the corner saying, the end is coming. <laughs> you have to protect your credibility. Do it God's way. Because God is always in control. Okay, now, uh, verse uh, 30, verse 31, 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. That, again, made it right. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. This uh, justified the just is the doc, okay, in the Hebrew tongue. And you should be able to kind of fit that together in your mind. 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? So let me ask you something. Are you afraid of this world? I don't know really why you would be as long as you're careful, as long as you use your head, you watch where you're going. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one can. In, in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, he gave us power over all of our enemies. If you have the belief to, to, to uh, horse that up, okay, do it. So it just doesn't matter. You, we are a very blessed people because we have an intercessor. Verse 32, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He will. Okay. If you need something to do his work with, now I'm not talking about your own, I'm not talking about your own private hobbies. I'm talking about doing things for God, okay? He'll, he'll give it to you. You'll get it. Okay? I'll say again, Shepherd's Chapel is a good example of that, okay? You, he'll give you all the bricks you need, but you just get to hustling and use those bricks, okay? 
who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. You see, if you're pleasing the judge, you don't have anything to worry about. Why? He's the one that's judging you. And do you know something? He knows even what you're thinking, so you don't have any secrets from him. He knows all about you. And that's great. Okay, He still loves you. And that's fantastic. Okay? Um, and um, verse 33, I'm going to read it again. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is God that justifieth? 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. He stands between. He stands with us. He's always there for you. That's why it's good to go back to these basics and under, have, receive the comfort that he has there for you, for the weak, those that need that lift, those that need that help. He makes that intercession. It's his promise. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or a sword? You know, Paul, Paul was put through a whole bunch. 36. And you are today in this world in certain aspects. As it is written, for, that, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You got that? I want you to let that settle in real good. We are more than conquerors. You think we're going to lose a war? You think we're going to... This, uh, the good old U.S. of A. is going to be taken in? Forget it. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, no height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's exactly the way it is. He's the intercessor. And there is no way, once you taste the beautiful fruit and the beauty of what's coming and what is, nobody can separate you from that. You won't settle for second best. You won't settle for traditions of men. You want the word of God and you want the truth. Do you know, God established Christ as a priest of priests. Though he was supposedly in the king line, I'll explain. He was supposedly of Judah, which is the king line. And how could he be a priest, which is the Levitical line from Levi, the daughters of Aaron? Well, we know a little secret, don't we? Mary, on the day she conceived, rushed to her cousin Elizabeth, who was a daughter of Aaron, a full-blood Levite, and was six months pregnant with John. They were cousins. So it means Mary's father was of Judah, but Mary's mother was a Levite. So Christ is both priest and king, rightfully so, fulfilling the word of God. Okay. So he established Christ forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek in the Hebrew tongue, Melcha is king. Okay. Zedek is of the just or righteous. Okay. It's God's elect. In closing, turn with me to where? Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. If you ever wonder who Melchizedek was, of course it was Christ, and, and the third verse here documents that. 
okay, of, of this chapter 7. That's not why we're here. But any good student of God's Word knows that Jesus Christ was... Well, how many... Is he king, not king of kings and lord of lords? I mean, that kind of says it, you know. But I, I'll read the third verse anyway. Without father, with, with Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Made like the Son of God. Why? Because he was the Son of God. Okay? Christ walked the earth long before. Um, I mean, he was with the Holy Spirit in the beginning. And uh, so it is written another time, another place. Skip with me all the way to verse uh, 21 of the seventh chapter. Our intercessor... A priest forever, not changing year to year, but we just got us a new pastor. No, you, we, we don't get new priest. We've got one. We're going to keep him. He is forever. It is Jesus Christ, and we follow him, and he does not have to slaughter animals or anything else. He is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 21. For those priests, let's say of Aaron, okay, were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, don't change his mind. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Do you know what this word surety is in the Greek? It's a guarantee. It's a legal term. It's guaranteed, if you will believe, a better testament. In other words, he, he enriches the whole book, old and new, both testaments. Um, verse 23, And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. You had to keep replacing them. They died off. Okay? But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Do you understand how important that is? Do you know how people... If you want to, if you want to create Babel, okay? you know, psychology can, can arrange this real quick for you, you know, when you get a Sharpie is to keep changing the base, okay? Keep moving the foundation. And you, you can cause confusion deluxe. Nothing ever changes with our Father's Word. That's why you're spending good time when you study it. And listen to me. As it is written in Mark 13, this world age will change, but God's word will never change, not even in the eternity. It stays the same. It is established. So you can, I, hey, you can hang it all on it. It's here. Once you research it and make sure you've got it right with the manuscripts, okay? It's here. It will never change. Verse 25, we're for he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. There it is again. That intercession. He continues to make it for you. He makes it for them. Who? The qualification was there. Those that believe upon him or that come to God through his testimony, through his testament, this testament, okay. He intercedes for them. Did you know what it said? I guarantee it. That's what that word surety. It's like, you know what it's like? Um, kind of like if you decide, always pay cash for a car, okay? If you can, don't, you know. But if you have to, if, if, you, if you're going to make a down payment on one, you have to put up earnest money. That surety, okay? That's what this is. It's your guarantee that Christ is going to be there for you, that he's going to intercede for you. Verse 26, For such an high priest became us, or for us, who is holy, harmless, 
undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Why? He's sitting at the right hand of God. And do you know something? He's for you. I say again, He's sitting at the right hand of God. And He makes intercession for you. Right there on the throne. And you wonder how He has the ability to intercede. He's there. 27. Who needeth not daily as those high priests, those over yonder, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. He did away with blood sacrifices, period. They were nailed to the cross. It's an abomination to think you have to offer any blood past that point. Verse 28, For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity. They got sin, okay? But the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son, who is consecrated forevermore. Always right. Always you're able to depend on Him. Always you can count on Him. He's not going to lead you astray. He's not going to change the foundation on you where you've got to move over and start all, figuring all over again in confusion, but in peace of mind, in contentment, to know he, he comes between. Okay? He stands between uh, you and trouble. He intercedes. That's a wonderful place to be, beloved, in this troubled world. Never before has it been necessary when we have spirits where people try to destroy themselves and don't care okay, that you need that intercessor who knows what's coming down the road and who knows what tomorrow brings. So that's why it's so ever important that you hang it on that security, that guarantee. He's your intercessor. It is true. You can make intercessory prayer for some people. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about between you and our Father and that Son that He seeks that you are able to accomplish what He would have you accomplish because He has chosen you. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Father, for our intercessor. We thank You, Father, for the Comforter, that Comforter that comforts us at all times, Father. Father, we look forward to that time and that day when that perfection is back on this earth and we see that beautiful nature, the streams, Father, and things as you had created them restored, Father. We look forward to it. Thank you again in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Matthew chapter 13, verse 35, a secret kept secret from the foundation of the world that concerning the tares. The good seed were planted by Almighty God, but the wicked, the tares, the Kenites, were planted by the devil. They are his children. Jesus taught that openly. He didn't apologize for it. They are a race of people, but they also, whomsoever will, can convert to Christianity. Sandra from Michigan. How does China fit into Ezekiel 38 and 39 or the end times? Ezekiel chapter 38 states those from the east, that is China, okay? 
the men from the east, uh, as you will read it in Ezekiel 38. Uh, Richard from Louisiana. Do you think it's possible to speak in tongues to God spiritually while someone is preaching the gospel? I know what tongues mean, but some of the pastors talk about tongues like you can say any kind of mumbo-jumbo and God will understand. Is it possible? Um, God doesn't like mumbo-jumbo any more than anybody else does. Okay. The tongue, Pentecostal tongue spoken on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2, verse 6, was not unknown. Quite the opposite. It was called the cloven tongue because it went out in every direction all at one time. In other words, they spoke Chinese, Russian, Japanese, English, Latin, Hebrew, Greek, all at one time. And whatever you heard it, heard it in the dialect of the very county in which they were born. No man can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can, um, can uh, speak. The, the word tongue is language, okay? And, and it means language. That's as it is. Other tongues will be mentioned in, uh, in Corinthians, what is it, chapter 14. And the Greek word there tongue means a language that you were not born with, meaning a language you had to learn. In other words, if I decided to go to see Dadi Mijeko to teach God's word from Jesus, then I would have to learn a great deal more Spanish than I now know so that they could clearly understand what I'm saying. Otherwise, he said, if they don't even know when to say amen by not understanding your tongue that you were born with, you better learn another one so you can spread the word of God, okay? And so it is, um, regardless of what preachers may say. I would, if I am teaching the word of God, I will not stand for an interruption in the congregation while God's word is being taught. Okay, that's not nice, it's not polite, and it's an insult to God. Uh, God doesn't like mumbo-jumbo, okay? He likes clarity, as spoken of by Joel the prophet, as it is written in Acts chapter 2. Lynn from Washington, does Iraq represent Babylon and Iran represent Persia? They not only represent, they are old Babylon and they are old Persia, okay? There's, there's no representing it to it. That's, that's where the geographical locations were. Uh, Rose from Arizona. My question is, is it a sin to be afraid to die? How to have more confidence? Well, well Rose, um, the, God gave us um, the will to live. It's called, you know, the, the, the will of survival causes us to be very careful and no one looks wants to rush death because God put us here for a purpose. Every, everybody has a purpose and a destiny. They just really haven't found them yet, but they've got one. Um, and it may be as one of the witnesses uh, against the spurious Messiah to give the warning that he comes first. Everyone has a destiny and a purpose and we want to finish that. But um, uh, we, when we say we fear death, physical death of the flesh is one thing, but no one has ever died. Spiritually speaking, all, there's no soul has died. There is one soul by name that has been sentenced to death, and that is Satan. But um, all, the, um, all others have still got judgment day to go through that decides whether they live or die the second death, which is to say the death of the soul. As it is written in Matthew chapter 10, verse 25 and 28, fear not he who can destroy your flesh body, kill your flesh body, but rather fear he who can kill both the flesh and cause your soul to perish. Zippo, blotted out, gone. So don't... Don't ever worry about being with the Father, okay? Don't let that frighten you. That's a wonderful thing. Tammy from Arkansas. 
Oh, man, I see how you've been divorced twice. I have people judge me as being terrible for getting a divorce. I was married to both 10 years each. My question, does God look bad on a situation like mine? No, I, I don't. I, I'm not going to judge, okay? But our father is very fair-minded. And even if one of them were your fault, and I don't see that it could have been, uh, and again, I'm not judging, but if you repent, it's, ra it's scratched clean anyway. And, and God loves you. Okay. So don't, don't ever, you know, this is the beauty of Christianity is forgiveness. One said, well, how, how many times, Jesus, should we forgive him? He said, seven times 70. 490 times. Okay. And uh, I don't think anyone can sin 490 times in a day. I haven't met one yet. That'd be bad, bad. Caesar from California. Can any member Christian preach even if he is not ordained? If he's got the gift, hey, go for it. You know, you know how you can tell when you're ready to preach or teach? People will want to hear what you've got to say. And as long as the people don't want to hear what you've got to say, then probably you're not ready. Okay. Most of all, ordination, it's, it's a fine thing. But ordination alone, uh, like you've always heard me say, you know, a lot of people will see this great GP in the sky, and they think it means go preach, and really it means go plow. Okay, so, so you've got to be careful. You can... When you're ready, then people will automatically, they're going to come to you. You're not going to have to worry about it. You're going to teach because God will demand it and people will demand it. So an ordination, as far as that's concerned, has very little to do with it. Many times an ordination paper settles your retirement and many other things, but it also settles what you teach. I would never be honest under that. Well, are you ordained? Well, yes, I am. But my ordination is such that I have no board that can tell me what to teach. They can fire me, but they can't tell me what to teach. Okay, and uh, many people would say, well, I'm going to write the president of your uh, network and get you fired. And, well, I am the president, so you go ahead and write me and we'll see what happens, okay? I'm, I'm very strict on myself. But I, I, we try to do a good job, and we hang tough, okay? So preach if you, you know, I, I don't want to take away, and don't think I'm doing that. All I'm saying is, is when you're ready, people are going to demand that you teach because you've got something to say. Don from California. Um, I, let me see where your question is. Uh, say, say something, some sins are... Some say things like some sins are too great to be forgiven. Now, that's, that's fake. That's false. The preacher on TV was talking about sin and that some are so bad uh, that here on earth, if you don't do jail time. <laughs> you know, what, what is this TV preacher then? And I'm not going to say any names. I'm glad you didn't put his name down here. He's setting himself up as a judge. There's one thing a preacher should never do is judge somebody, okay? A father's judge. A real teacher of God's word teaches forgiveness. When one, when one repents, better help him forgive. Better help him repent and get it behind him. And where, where is this written in God's word that some sins are too great that you've got to do jail time? They're not. He's lying. Okay. It's not there. When you repent, it's erased. Now, that doesn't mean some people are not going to do jail time if they get caught being a criminal. But, um, uh, but as far as earthly sins go that are not criminal, then they're forgivable by Almighty God. He paid an awesome price to bring forgiveness. And that, that is the beauty of Christianity. You know, some Christians like to take churches. Once you've done a certain thing, they put you in a box, or they try to. This person is a divorcee. Oh, 
Oh, mercy, the de divorcee can no longer teach Sunday school and we must keep them away from my children. Now, wh where is that written in the Bible? It isn't. It's the church. Kirch, I'll even call it. Um, you know, uh, I, I, um, I really detest people that take away the power of Jesus Christ that insult him, that insult his death on the cross, that he doesn't have the right for forgiveness. It's a shame. Because that is, again, the beauty of Christianity that makes it grow and grow and grow and grow. But some of these churches like to put up binders and chains and, and, uh, and hold people down until they drive people away, away, away. Um, thank you for helping and a big smile. Judy from Michigan. Also, I have one question. I've heard that if you never read the Bible in your life, you should read Revelations because if you don't, you will automatically go to hell. Is that true? No. You know, I don't know where some of these things get started or anything, but that, that is not true. You know, many people, unfortunately, can't read. And they listen to a good teacher, and they really try to live the word. So you see, that would put that totally off the board. No, that's not true at all. One should do their very best. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. How do I know that? You wouldn't be listening if you didn't, okay? It makes God's day. Let him know you love him. He'll love you in return. Brought to you by tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, My little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, This is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the Epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Let's complete stewardship. Now, as I told you in the last lecture, of all the words in Hebrew and Greek which are translated to steward or stewardship in the English, uh, you could kind of equalize them simply by saying in charge of. And you've got it. God 